Hello and welcome to this uh, tutorial introduction to um, comparative politics, the subfield of political science known as comparative politics. In this tutorial I'm going to discuss why we do comparisons at all and then I'm going to discuss how to manage your methods, specifically quantitative versus qualitative methods, uh, tied to reliability and validity, the two terms that I'm going to uh, explain and, and elaborate on. And then I'll finish up with some uh, with uh, some notes on uh, common concerns for comparativists. So let's start. Why do we compare? Well, uh, comparative politics is a social science, and like all social scientists sciences, we do not have a lab. We do not have a large hadron collider in which we can collide politicians against each other. Uh, for ethical reasons, um, uh, of course, uh, and uh, as such, uh, we have to do something else. And because there is still the issue of isolating variables, if we want to find cause and effect of something that's happening, and there is really so many variables going on in, in politics, and comparison so thus allows us to uh, uh, identify causes that might not be immediately identifiable in a, a single uh, political system. Uh, so uh, someone once said, uh, I'm paraphrasing, I believe, uh, who, what do they of England know who only England knows? The point being that um, if you're only looking at a single political system, uh, it's going to be really difficult to say if, if it's very effective or if it's very representative democratically, unless you compare it to other political systems, similar or different ones, to find what works and what doesn't work. Uh, so this is, is uh, uh, one really important reason. It creates reference points for us. So comparative politics, then, is really a way to try and simulate uh, laboratory conditions to isolate variables and find causes of social phenomena. Uh, but, of course, to do so, we need to manage our methods uh, well. So this is going to be an overview of what you need to think about to, to manage methods, uh, particularly uh, this, there is the tension here between quantitative and, and qualitative methods to, cons to, to consider. This is, is intertwined with the balancing of reliability and validity. And I'll go over both of these terms, starting with uh, reliability. This is really uh, concerning how rigorous and, and robust the scientific method you're, you're applying really is, but also uh, is the produced material representative of what you're studying. And to do that you have to have a, a representative sample, uh, which is often a very large sample. So uh, what we do is, is uh, use quantitative methods, statistical methods, statistical data, uh, because these, this type of data can be used to study really large samples. We're talking thousands and hundreds and thousands of people uh, if you're doing surveys and respond, uh, have respondents, or s several dozens of countries if you're looking at political systems, for instance. The problem involved with using quantitative data is, uh, are all ideas really quantifiable? Uh, can we be sure they are? Uh, freedom, for instance. How do you how do you put numbers to freedom? That's not an easy uh, uh, question to answer. And uh, if you've ever taken a survey and you have uh, looked at the questions for the survey and, and you haven't been satisfied with the questions because you, you think that they were uh, incorrectly formulated or based on incorrect assumptions, or maybe you didn't like the answer alternatives of the survey, you didn't, you wanted to add something to explain your particular point, but you were kind of forced into uh, the, the ready-made uh, maquette. Well, uh, then this is really what you're tapping into, the, the, the issue of um, uh, if all ideas are, are quantifiable. Maybe you mean something quite different by, by freedom than the researchers would. Um, so this is a concern when working with, with quantitative 
data. One example of this type of study, though, is, is uh, uh, Ronald Ingerhart's World Value Survey. This is uh, quite unique. Uh, it's a database uh, by now of uh, decades worth of opinion data taken from hundreds of countries with hundreds and thousands of respondents. And there's really only way to do this, and this is by doing a quantitative survey. Uh, to process hundreds and thousands of, of answers over over such a long period of time. So this is the, the best it, it gets. And even here we have, have uh, these issues of, of uh, quantifiability and so on. So for instance, if you look here, you have on this axis the secular rational values and, on this, and, and down here is the traditional values. How do you draw the line between those and how do you put numbers to that? Uh, and, and can we be sure that a respondent in the US and a respondent in Albania uh, defines terms in the same way in, in the survey? Uh, that might not at all be, be taken for granted. So these are some of the concerns uh, with this type of, of study. And all of these have to do with validity, really. Uh, in other words, if we're studying the relevant processes and, and qualitative methods can ascertain that we are. So if you're if doing large scale surveys uh, has this problem, then the answer would be interviews because if, if you're sitting down with the respondents or you're talking for half an hour or an hour, uh, you can uh, really get a good sense of what your respondent really means on a deeper, much deeper level. Uh, and uh, you can do the same for pro uh, political processes. And this is where the case study comes in. If you gather qualitative data from a single case, uh, you can study social pro processes with a lot more nuance than you could when you're gathering data uh, from uh, hundreds of, of cases. And this can actually be used in an implicitly comparative manner. So, uh, for instance, uh, say that you've read someone else's comparative work doing work with, with more cases, and you want to test that, that theory, so you go into a single case. Or you had an interesting experience doing uh, uh, research on a single case, and you want to see if that transfers to other cases. Well, maybe the first st uh, step on, the, on that road is to just do a study of, of that single case keeping in the back of your mind that you're later going to pick these, these conclusions and these concepts and, and the tools that you develop in that study in, uh, for, for, other, uh, for other cases to compare. The problem with using qualitative data, though, is the flip one from using quantitative data. And this is, can we be sure that material from just a single case is representative for every or even many other cases? And the answer tends to be no, we can't be sure. Now here's a, an example of a qualitative study, uh, Bent Flubjerg's uh, study on municipal uh, politics and planning studies. Uh, effectively, it was a study on uh, large-scale infrastructure projects, you know, like building a bridge or a stadium. And uh, it found that there is an incentive for those who plan these, these uh, projects to uh, underestimate the costs of a project, because then it's uh, the likelihood of getting it passed through city council is much higher. So we should actually not be surprised when a project like this go, goes over budget. We should expect it because there, because of the incentive structures involved in the decision, decision making. Because you can let, uh, when the decision has been made, you can let the costs go after that, uh, because then the decision is made and you have to stick to it. But before then, you, so there is a strong incentive mechanism there. It appears to, to actually um, under plan the expected costs. Uh, this is an interesting example because it shows what you can do when you really go into detail in a single case. But it also uh, has the problem of, can we be sure that uh, what happened in this municipality is representative for others? Uh, what about municipalities in other countries? Will they work the same way? And so on. So all these questions uh, can arise from, from this type of more qualitative uh, work. Uh, so this is really uh, the tension between the reliability and validity. If you do a study uh, with a really massive amount of data, uh, what you're going to get is, is a highly is a study that has a lot of uh, reliability and that is highly representative, but that doesn't go in depth into the the 
uh, material very much. So we can't be sure about the validity. It's going to have high reliability but weak validity. But if you do a study that goes really in depth into the material and try to analyze the, the nuances of, of the social process in great detail, you're going to get very few cases uh, and that means that you're going to have strong validity but you're going to have fairly weak reliability because you can't be sure that it's representative for all the, the, the processes. Uh, one way to manage this maybe could be to do a mid-range study. Now, as, as you will notice here, I've placed the, it's, it's kind of in between, but it means that it's going to have uh, decent reliability and decent validity. It's not going to have high or, of, of either. It's going to have kind of medium in both. Uh, so uh, for some, this is a, a good answer to the conundrum of reliability and validity. For others, it's uh, just a study that is kind of half good in both. Uh, and and it, it's really up to uh, you as a scholar to decide how you feel about each of, of these these uh, methods. Uh, but uh, this uh, mid-range study here uh, is a good example of how you can negotiate uh, the problem and kind of comp find a compromise between the two polarities. Uh, uh, this is where you work with a fairly small sample. And this is, uh, I'm using the example of Theta Scotch Pulse states and social revolutions. So what she did was compare French and, and Russian and Chinese uh, revolutions to discuss how the different uh, uh, social situation at the, out, out the, at the start of the revolution, how that affected the outcome. So the different institutional context, what was the setup of the different states, what was the setup of, of uh, the actors at the get-go, if you will. And what you do here is that you have uh, the choice of studying revolutions. There are only so many revolutions that have happened in the world, so that limits kind of the, the how big a sample you, you would need to, to begin with. Uh, and uh, she's using three cases. She's studying each in, in some detail, uh, not as great as if she would only be studying a single one. Uh, but certainly more than if she were to study, say, half of all the revolutions that have happened uh, over the world. Uh, so it's, it's a, it works out like a compromise where she gets at least some detail, uh, but still some form of representation uh, and negotiates these two, the tension between reliability and validity that way. Two other common concerns for comparativists uh, have to do with how many cases that you, you need to make the study valid and reliable. Well, as I've noted uh, before here, is uh, that you probably can't get both. You probably have to ch pick and choose a little bit between uh, valid and reliable, which one you really want to satisfy. Um, but also, you should decide this depending on the research question that you have devised. Um, uh, so first you, you formulate your research question, what do you want to find out? And then you pick your tools to the tools that are best suited to answer that. So it's actually going to, the tools you pick, quantitative or qualitative, it's going to be a unique combination for each new question that you, you ask. Um, a second thing that's really important to keep in mind here has to do with how to create concepts that can be used anywhere in the world. Uh, so each concept has started from somewhere. Um, if we take freedom or, or democracy, for instance, we, we start with an uh, example where we illustrate this concept. Uh, the challenge here is to formulate uh, something that, that has started in one place and, and formulate the concept, the analytical tool that we're going to use for, for analysis elsewhere in such a way that, that it can actually be applied in some other place. And this can be a challenge because it's, it's really difficult to achieve some form of neutrality around these concepts. Uh, if you study something in a municipality in the US, for instance, uh, how do you create the concepts to be able to study processes in a municipality in, in Poland or, or Italy? Uh, that, that can be a challenge. You need to uh, create the concepts so that uh, it's clear from anyone who, who will read your study that you would actually be studying the same kind of phenomena in these different places. So these are some of the common concerns that will confront any uh, comparativist uh, and uh, that you should keep in mind uh, when you start uh, doing your own study. Hope that uh, you found this useful.